the flesh melts, the forehead bulges more prominently, the cheekbones protrude, the skeleton is working itself through, the eyes are already sunken in, in a couple hours it will be over. He is not the first I have seen thus, but we grew up together and that always makes it a bit different. I have copied his essays. At school he used to wear a brown coat with a belt and shiny sleeves. He was the only one of us two who could do the giant's turn on the horizontal bar. His hair flew in his face like silk when he did it. Cantorek was proud of him, but he couldn't stand cigarettes. His skin was very white. He had something of the girl about him. I glanced at my boots. They are big and clumsy and the breeches are tucked into them and standing up one looks well built and powerful in these great drain pipes. But when we go bathing and strip, suddenly we have slender legs again and slight shoulders. We are no longer soldiers, but little more than boys. No one would believe that we could carry packs. It is a strange moment when we stand naked, when we become civilians and almost feel ourselves to be so. When bathing, Franz Kemmerich looked as slight and frail as a child. Here he lies now, but why? The whole world ought to pass by this bed and say, that is Franz Kemmerich, 19 and a half years old. He doesn't want to die. Let him not die. My thoughts became confused. This atmosphere of carbolic and gangrene clogs the lungs. It is a thick gruel. It suffocates. It grows dark. Kemmerich's face changes color. It lifts from the pillow and is so pale that it gleams. The mouth moves slightly. I draw near to him. He whispers, if you find my watch, send it home. I do not reply. It is no use anymore. No one can console him. I am wretched with helplessness. This forehead with its hollow temples, this mouth that now seems all teeth, this sharp nose, and the fat, weeping woman at home to whom I must write. If only the letter were sent off already. Hospital orderlies go to and fro with bottles and pails. One of them comes up, casts a glance at Kemmerich, and goes away again. You can see he is waiting. Apparently, he wants the bed. I bend over Franz and talk to him as though that could save him. Perhaps he will go to the convalescent home in Klosterberg, among the villas, Franz. Then you can look out from the window across the fields to the two trees on the horizon. It is the loveliest time of year now, when this corn ripens. At evenings, the fields in the summer, in, in the sunlight, look like the mother of pearl and the lane of poplars by the clusterback, where we used to catch sicklebacks, sticklebacks. You can, build a, you can build an aquarium again and keep fish in it, and you can go without asking anyone. You can even play the piano if you want to. I lean down over his face, which lies in the shadow. He still breathes lightly. His face is wet. He is crying. What a fine mess I have made of it with my foolish talk. But Franz, I put my arm around, him, around his shoulder and put my face against his. Will you sleep now? He does not answer. The tears run down his cheeks. I would like to wipe them away, but my handkerchief is too dirty. An hour passes. I sit, I sit tensely and watch his every movement in case he may perhaps say something. What if he were to open his mouth and cry out? But he only weeps. His head, his head turned aside. He does not speak of his mother or his brothers and sisters. He says nothing. All that lies behind him. He is entirely alone now with his little life of 19 years and cries because it leaves him. This is the most disturbing and hardest, part, and hardest parting that I've ever seen. Although it was pretty bad too with Tiaden, who called for his mother a big bear of a fellow who with eyes full, with wide eyes full of terror, held off the doctor from his bed with a dagger until he collapsed. Suddenly Kemmerich groans and begins to gurgle. I jump up, stumble outside and demand, where's the doctor, where's the doctor? As I catch sight of the white apron, I seize hold of it. Come quick, Franz Kemmerich is dying. He frees himself and asks an orderly standing by, which will that be? He says, bed 26, amputated thigh. He sniffs. How should I know anything about it? I've amputated five legs today. He shoves me away, says to the hospital orderly, you see to it, and hurries off to the operating room. I tremble with rage as I go along with the orderly. The man looks at me and says, one operation after another since five o'clock this morning. You know, today alone, there have been 16 deaths. Yours is the 17th. There will probably be 20 altogether. I become faint. 
All at once, I cannot do any more. I won't revile any more. It is senseless. I could drop down and never rise up again. We are by Kemrick's bed. He is dead. The face is still wet from the tears. The eyes are half open and yellow, like an old horn, like old horn buttons. The orderly pokes me in the ribs. Are you taking his things with you? I nod. He goes on. We must take him away at once. We want the bed. Outside, they are lying on the floor. I collect Kemrick's things and untie his identification disc. The orderly asks about the pay book. I say it is probably in the orderly room and go. Behind me, they are already hauling Franz onto a waterproof sheet. Outside the door, I'm aware of the darkness and the wind as a deliverance. I breathe as deep as I can and feel the breeze in my face, warm and soft as never before. Thoughts of girls, of flowery meadows, of white clouds suddenly come into my head. My feet begin to move forward in my boots. I go quicker, I run. Soldiers pass by me. I hear their voices without understanding. The earth is streaming with the forces, with forces which pour into me through the soles of my feet. The night crackles electrically. The front, thun the front thunders like a concert of drums. My limbs move supplely. I feel my joints strong. I breathe the air deeply. The night lives, I live. I feel a hunger greater than comes from the belly alone. Muller stands in front of the hut waiting for me. I give him the boots. We go in and he tries them on. They fit well. He roots among his supplies and offers me a fine piece of saveloy. With it goes hot tea and rum. <laughs>